Two people have something to say. First chapter, the cat and the president. President Obama chilling at the office, swaying to the beats. Stop! Don't do this! Why? Stop it, buddy. You're embarrassing yourself. Moreover, it's not morally right for a president of a country to dance in the office. What are you blathering about? <gasps> what? Garfield just gave a moral talk to President Obama. Now Alex, a witness of this conversation, says, Garfield's suggestion was a moral talk to Obama. And his opinion about moral talk is that it's just an expression of personal feeling. If I say that something is right or wrong, I'm just giving vent to my feelings. If I tell you that it's wrong to force someone to do something against their will, I'm only doing so because I feel bad about it and want you to feel the same way as well. Choosing the right principles just doesn't come into it, since feelings can't be either right or wrong. Let's evaluate. So, if we look at Alex's statement, he's trying to say moral talk is nothing but advice based on one's feelings and you share to some person to make them feel the same way. Right. And now he's saying that principles aren't right. As in, principles cannot be just formed for the sake of it. There has to be some feelings involved in it. And there are no such principles that exist without one's involvement of feelings. Well, whatever Alex said might be quite correct. We have to take in other factors into consideration. Now, other factors are like the process of thinking. Now, if we take a step back and try to understand how ethics work, ethics asks us to think mindfully or use the process mindful thinking. So, mindful thinking is the process of analyzing a situation and the factors surrounding the situation before making a decision. Now, this requires some patience. Plus, we can also understand that feelings can be easily manipulated. And it's not just feelings itself, but the way things are expressed sometimes. Precisely, language and context. Let's say, News Channel A reports an incident in this way. President Obama dancing in the office without preparing for the G20 cabinet meeting tomorrow. Now, News Channel B reports the same incident as children from Washington DC daycare groove along with President Obama during his lunch break. Morally speaking, a person such as the president dancing in the office is obviously considered unethical and unprofessional and unacceptable principle. But in this case, the language used by the news media makes the person think twice. Now here the process of thinking comes. And it's a general principle of life, a general moral in the society to have a good time in life. So in cases like these, a problem arises. If we just consent morals associated with feelings, problems like these happen where you're not able to choose which moral to go ahead with. Obviously, at a situation like this, you have to choose an option. A uh, choice can't be just left unselected. Now in this case, we tend to analyze, we assess the situation and think, think about which moral would be acceptable in this case and which can be, let's say, neglected or forgiven in this case. So in this example, we need to ask ourselves why we feel as we do so. And once we assess and think about both the morals, we're able to come to a conclusion, at least most of us, by saying that in special occasions like these where children who look up to the president, the president can spend some fun time with the children and there is nothing quite wrong in doing so. Second chapter. Raw fish? No thanks. Chef Taka slicing and dicing the fish. Hey Bernard, would you like to try some delicious sushi? Ew! How do you guys even eat this? It's completely raw.
Betty, a witness of this conversation, feels right or wrong can only mean right and wrong in a particular culture. It is totally misguided to use the standards of one's culture, invariably one's own, to pass a moral judgment on an action performed within the context of a different culture. As no one can be said to be right or wrong in a dispute like this, it is better simply to say, you're right from your side and I'm right from mine. Respect the diversity of cultures. No one is right, so live and let live. Now, the behavior of judging another culture from your cultural perspective is good or bad? Let's evaluate. So if we take a look at Betty's statement and analyze it, she says right and wrong is defined in its own terms according to one's culture and judging culture A from the point of view of a culture B is very discriminative and she uses a more stronger word called misguided and judging another culture from your point of view is considered immoral an immoral act for her and responding to situations like these are unnecessary and it brings up the question who am I to judge but she instead insists on using this sort of situation like X statement is right from your side, but Y statement is right from my side. Let's keep it that way. Let's respect the diversity of cultures. Cultures are different on their own, and we must learn to respect them instead of discriminating or arguing with other culture. It's a simple concept of live and let the others live as well. So this concept, which Betty strongly pursues, is known as cultural relativism, where one specific thing may be considered moral in one society uh, which will also be considered immoral in another society and since there is no universal standard of morality no one's to judge over here while i agree with betty's statement for the most part about cultural relativism i like to first discuss some of the issues i have with that concept so there are a few situations where this concept would not uh, fare off well for example, let's say you're upset with your neighbor. Without thinking you can kill the person if your culture accepts murder as a morally acceptable act. And this is a problem and would create immense chaos. Under the concept of cultural relativism, the ability to judge is removed. And let's take this example. 100 years ago, women, a lot of women from different cultures were not allowed to vote. But now it's not the case. Now, both were right in his own time. Now since the ability to judge is removed, we cannot judge progress now. So that becomes an issue. With this being said, uh, there are plenty more ways in which practicing cultural relativism is beneficial. Let's say many times traditions of old cultures have been wiped off. Let's take an example of Native Americans who signed treaties with the foreign investors. They were able to proclaim their lands but they had to trade some of their culture for that. And under the theory of cultural relativism, this trade won't be necessary. Uh, with respect to Betty's uh, last statement, that is, respect the diversity of cultures, it is true because there are a lot, lot of cultures across the world and they all have different ideas. So pursuing the different definitions of success, for example, the system provides the individual definition instead of group definition and thus, it's a different way in which society can evolve because respect is already built into the process and each individual definition of success can only increase the potential to achieve more because there is no limitations like we have in groups. So to conclude and given the reasons, I would say I'd certainly to a great extent agree with Betty and her statement on cultural relativism. Although there are certain cases where it may not apply uh, to a complete sense, complete perfect sense, there are many other places and much more benefits of applying this concept. Thank you.